The panel's moderator is Mr. Tsuyoshi Snohara, who is senior staff writer at Nikkei, and an expert journalist, a prolific writer on international relations, diplomacy, security, politics, U.S.-Japan relations, among other issues. He's also a SOFIA graduate. So, Mr. Snohara. Morning, and uh, my name is Tsuyoshi Snohara. As uh, Doden-san introduced myself uh, kindly, I'm also a graduate from Sofia University back in 83. And then I joined my company, Nikkei Newspaper. It's a Japanese Wall Street Journal. And I've been here as a White House correspondent more than 10 years. And then I joined at the uh, Georgetown rated think tank CSIS back in 2003. So I think it's very natural and reasonable for me to be a bridge between Georgetown and Sofia University. And uh, it's nice to be back here in my second hometown. Um, before starting our session, um, I'd like to ask you to join me praying for those who lost their lives on September 11, 2001. This is one day before September 11, I know, but I was here as a White House correspondent. I still remember that day clearly, so I want to ask you to join me just a second for praying for those who lost their lives. Please. Thank you. Thanks so much. Now, uh, we have uh, four uh, excellent speakers here on this stage. Uh, Dr. Hiwatari from Sofia University, Dr. Green from Georgetown University, Mr. Ueki from United Nations, and Dr. Cha from Georgetown University. I'd like to ask you, uh, four of you, uh, to make a brief uh, of our comments on the U.S. Japan relationship and uh, Pacific Asia. Then I'd like to uh, touch upon four topic, talking points uh, later on. So why don't we start from you, Dr. Hibatari, please? Thank you very much. Is this microphone? OK. Um, yesterday, uh, Senator uh, Dash talked about 4D model of uh, US foreign policy or US uh, global leadership. And uh, I respect Senator's view on that. But uh, I have a little, dif little bit different view on uh, this 4D model, especially when I think about uh, Japanese national security policy. Um, I think uh, the rebalancing of this among this 4D uh, components is actually uh, for the United States is a natural thing to do, but to Japan, I think, uh, of course, diplomacy is important, but uh, in Japan's case, I think defense should be put much more emphasis on uh, our thinking about national security. And having said that, I would like to talk about uh, the US-Japan alliance from the military uh, standpoint, military perspective. Uh, Relocation of Tenma Air Station near Okinawa and related U.S. base realignment is important, of course. But the real issue to me um, is how to enhance Japan's self-defense forces capability and establish it as a military of democratic country so that both Japan and the United States can respond to China's maritime expansion and North Korea's nuclear threat more efficiently. Um, especially, I would like to emphasize the importance of maritime self-defense force, Japanese Navy, and uh, its close cooperation uh, with the US Navy. Uh, I, I like that kind of you know, co collaboration more closely. It should be uh, more closely, and I would like to see more than uh, more about that. And uh, I would like to emphasize uh, three points. Uh, the first one is a Japanese constitutional change, uh, especially the latter uh, part of Article 9. Um, uh, it says uh, Japan cannot have uh, land, sea, and air forces. And I think it's not right. Uh, we should have. Uh, legitimate uh, Japanese Navy, Air Force, Army, and give them more responsibility. Uh, you know, when we 
called Japanese Navy as Japan Maritime Self Defense Force is tongue twisting. <laughs> I don't. Uh, every time I say that, I you know just like uh, <laughs> so Japanese Navy is much more easier to say, right? <laughs> okay, um, uh, but uh, of course uh, we changed the Article Nine and we gave the legitimate status status to uh, the current. Uh, self-defense forces, we need much more reform of Japanese institution. We have to think about uh, security policy more deeply. And uh, I actually, I personally uh, don't like to be in the same camp of uh, sort of alarmist, uh, right-wing, old nationalist. So we need to think more uh, positively and uh, you know, in the modern J Japan, or you know, younger people like you, uh, think, have to think more freely about Japan's national defense and U.S.-Japan security uh, co cooperation. And the second point is uh, permit the right of collective self-defense. Uh, without coll collective self-defense, we cannot call Japan-U.S. security treaty an alliance. Uh, so uh, that's uh, uh, my second point. But again, we have to be very cautious. Uh, this is not a simple matter, and we cannot just say, oh, okay, uh, we permit the right of collective self-defense. That's not easy. And uh, this is about a fundamental change of our mindset the civilians, political leaders, and the scholars, everyone, should be more knowledgeable about military affairs and the military itself. Uh, people should learn more about what the use of force is, uh, understanding war, understanding det deterrence, uh, how to uh, avoid uh, use the use of force, uh, you know, uh, such kind of thing, and uh, what the military should do uh, what kind of mission should the civilian leadership give to the military? And uh, as a political scientist, I would like to uh, establish Japanese uh, security studies and give it a more robust uh, foundation so that uh, students can learn more about Japanese uh, self-defense force and the uh, Ministry of Self, uh, Defense or security policy itself. And my third point is uh, uh, abenomics uh, and structural reform of domestic politics. Uh, success of uh, abenomics and uh, uh, structural reform should be given the highest priority. Without structural reform and economic growth of Japan, uh, Japan cannot give the uh, self-defense force sufficient uh, resources and capability. Uh, there is always imbalance between the uh, self-defense forces expanding missions and the defense budget. So uh, this, uh, with, uh, without this economic growth and the substantial uh, reduction of budget deficit, by the way, the Japanese budget deficit is the worst among capitalist democracies, 200% uh, of GDP. That's, that's huge. So uh, we should fix this problem. Uh, and uh, upon uh, the basis of robust Japanese economy and economic growth policy, uh, we can build up uh, the self-defense forces capability. So economy is very important. And uh, uh, so in a nutshell, um, give the Japan Self-Defense Force uh, a strong, strong foothold and get Abe's reform done. That's my point. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hiwatari. <clears throat> so next to you, Dr. Green. So um, the U.S.-Japan alliance today looks very different from when I was a graduate student, um, which was in the late 80s. Um, I 
should have gone to Georgetown and Sophia. I made a big mistake. I went to SICE and Tokyo University, <laughs> um, but I recovered somehow. Um, it was the Cold War still. You know, students like me wore flannel shirts. I met this guy from Columbia named Victor Cha who was really into disco. <laughs> not, not really. Um, uh, and in public opinion polls, when Americans were asked in 1987, 88, <clears throat> what's the biggest threat to the United States? Um, they would generally answer Japan's economy, not the Soviet nuclear missiles. And when people were asked, can you trust Japan? Uh, the results were usually 20 to 25% who said yes. And Japanese politicians were afraid to use the word dome, alliance, to describe the relationship with the United States. <clears throat> um, and this was at a time when we had the Soviet Union uh, sitting right in front of us both. So a lot of people predicted, given all of this, when the Cold War ends, the US-Japan alliance is going to fall apart. That was pretty much the mainstream uh, logic of the um, academics in both the US and Japan. <clears throat> um, Professor Cha, myself, Sheila Smith, um, others were in a small minority um, who, who uh, of course, turned out to be, be right about the future of the alliance. Um, today, in opinion polls, uh, when Americans are asked, um, what country do you trust the most? Um, it depends on the polling, but at um, the German Marshall Fund or Chicago Council on Global Affairs or Pew Polling. In general, Americans say they trust Britain, Canada, Australia, Japan. Japan usually comes in ahead of every ally that's not um, an Anglo-speaking, uh, 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 English-speaking um, ally from World War I and II. <clears throat> Remarkable change. When, when people were asked in the Chicago Council uh, poll, which I worked on, what countries do you trust to do free trade agreements? among those that we don't have them with right now. Japan came in number one. When people were asked, do you support free trade, over half said no. Would you support a free trade agreement with Japan, over half said yes. So it's a remarkable transition. Our um, navies now talk about each other as navies. Um, you know, my friends in the US Navy don't talk about the MSDF, they talk about the Japanese Navy. <laughs> um, uh, our intelligence sharing is better. In the Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP, uh, the media, Nikkei Shimbun and others tried desperately to make this, you know, a clash of American and Japanese economic models. Um, it's quite obvious in the rounds of negotiations now underway that the U.S. and Japan are on the same side in 90, 95 percent of the issues uh, because we both have a stake in our investments in China and Southeast Asia and elsewhere. So it's a remarkable change. It was remarkable that um, enemies became allies the way we did after World War II, and it's equally remarkable that at the end of the Cold War, the alliance became stronger. The challenge for the next generation is that while the alliance uh, is stronger in terms of public support, support for the US-Japan alliance in Japan is also at all-time highs. And I should say, by the way, a lot of credit for this is due to Ichiro Fujisaki, uh, Japan's very capable ambassador here, who had to navigate this relationship through the first major change of government in Japan in half a century and the worst natural disaster in Japan in almost a century. And, uh, we came out at the end of it with an alliance that's much stronger. And I just want to briefly thank uh, Ichiro Fujisaki for that. Yeah. And he retired from farm ministry just in time because now the problems are much harder. <laughs> um, we have um, TPP moving forward, but how do we integrate China? Um, everyone expects at some point China will be part of this, but how do we do that given the enormous challenges and changes in nationalism in the Chinese economy. Our alliance is stronger, but in the Cold War, uh, the Japanese side worried about fujikomare, entrapment in US wars with Russia or China. Now Americans worry about entrapment in a Japanese war with China over Senkakus. It's much more complicated than it used to be. Um, our intelligence sharing is much more important uh, than it ever was. Um, and the importance of Japan's economy is very, very important as a US national interest to maintain a balance of power in Asia. So although the alliance is, by all metrics, performing better, and after some pretty hard challenges, um, the problems we face are much, much more complicated and require a much more agile, strategic way of thinking. So this conference is a great opportunity. Um, and your um, work and future as students at Sophia and at Georgetown are, are a great hope for all of us who've worked on it so far. Thank you. Thank you. So, Mr. Wick. 
Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Hiro Ueki. I call myself Hiro, uh, even though my full name is Yasuhiro, uh, because it sounds like a hero in English. So, so I always call, call, call myself, I'm your hero. Um, I am also a, a Sofia graduate. Um, then uh, I came straight to Columbia University, uh, studied uh, in the School of International Affairs, um, and then moved on to the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, political science major, I uh, got my PhD, but before uh, got, I got my PhD, I actually joined the UN in 1982. So even though I may look very young, uh, actually I'm quite a bet veteran of the UN. Um, the, uh, um, we are given uh, um, four sub-themes, and um, we'll come back to that. Uh, uh, on this panel, uh, I think uh, um, Mr. Sunohara and I are probably the only people who ever visited North Korea uh, in, uh, in, a, in different... Oh, you're sorry, sorry I'm sorry. Oh, oh, you're sorry. Sorry, I'm sorry. Um, I was not given full briefing. Um, uh, I worked as a UN... We in on submarine, nobody knew. <laughs> okay. um, I, uh, on, occasion, uh, on occasions, worked as a UN spokes spokesperson. Uh, so um, uh, I always tell uh, substantive people that uh, uh, if you want me to be your, your uh, spokesperson or ally, uh, you have to brief me. <laughs> um, the, uh, um, before, uh, I, I think um, I may just touch briefly uh, uh, in this opening uh, uh, session um, uh, about Syria because uh, I worked uh, as a UN spokesman uh, for inspectors in Baghdad uh, prior to the Iraq war. Uh, our inspectors are deployed uh, for uh, four months, uh, from November to mid-November mid to mid-March, uh, 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 until two days before, actually, the Iraq war uh, began. And uh, I was the only person who was authorized uh, uh, in Baghdad to speak to the press, to speak publicly on what was happening on the ground. And um, uh, the current crisis reminds me of um, um, uh, those days when uh, the US actually went to war uh, without uh, obtaining the authorization of the Security Council. And also um, uh, when, the, uh, when NATO um, uh, staged the uh, uh, military strike at the uh, new Yugoslavia, uh, basically Savia. Back in 99, um, I was uh, uh, at that time still in the spokesperson's office uh, for the Secretary General. Um, and then uh, I was deployed to East Timor uh, to organize a referendum uh, over there. But uh, um, uh, also I witnessed uh, um, NATO going, um, I mean, resorting to the use of force uh, without um, obtaining um, uh, support from the Security Council because the world was divided. Um, uh, and particularly uh, in the case of Kosovo, of course, the Russian Federation uh, opposed any use of force. Uh, and the, at the time of the Iraq, uh, prior to the Iraq war, um, uh, the whole world was split. Uh, even among US allies, uh, uh, there were uh, those who opposed um, uh, the US and others, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, going to Iraq um, to topple the government, basically, um, believing that uh, Iraq still had possessed uh, new weapons of mass destruction or uh, was developing such weapons. And uh, um, the UN inspection uh, team uh, was deployed to ascertain whether Iraq, in fact, uh, had uh, still uh, possessed uh, uh, such weapons or uh, was developing. And as you know now, um, uh, it turned out that Iraq, uh, as they were in fact telling us, uh, that um, they um, uh, didn't um, uh, develop any uh, such weapons um, um, since uh, the uh, Gulf, their defeat in the Gulf War uh, much earlier in 1991. And, but um, at that time, uh, um, we were wondering why, uh, we insisted in fact when we deployed to uh, uh, Iraq um, to the uh, uh, Iraqi government that uh, uh, on the basis of the Security Council Resolution uh, 1441, uh, we uh, have unprecedented right to inspect um, uh, Iraq um, whenever, uh, wherever uh, we uh, found it necessary for us to inspect. 
uh, any sites. And uh, we really stress to the Iraqi government uh, that they had to cooperate with us, and this will be your last opportunity. Uh, despite that uh, insistence, uh, uh, Iraq really uh, um, initially uh, was saying we didn't have anything, um, with no documents to provide, uh, no additional information on where they had destroyed uh, uh, weapons of mass destruction. And only after the famous Korean power speech in the Security Council, the Iraqis came back to us uh, to say, in fact, we have more documents. Uh, we know more sites where we destroyed biological weapons and so forth. And we call it, I call it the strategic ambiguity of the president, uh, Saddam Hussein at that time, um, uh, to, 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 he didn't want to show that Iraq was weak. Um, and uh, um, they should have cooperated with us fully, then the Iraqi war, uh, Iraq war could have been avoided. This time around, Syria. The moment I heard on the news um, that uh, uh, the US could go um, on, um, uh, could initiate a military strike uh, even as early as three days, I, I didn't believe it. Uh, this would not be possible. Um, first, the UN inspectors on the ground um, um, yes, collecting samples uh, uh, from uh, those who are affected by uh, allegations of uh, uh, chemical uh, weapons attack. And uh, um, the US um, would initially, the UK, as you know, um, uh, expressed a, a very strong uh, inclination to um, join the US and uh, France uh, to initiate a military strike, but the parliament blocked it. Why? Uh, still, we live in the, uh, uh, we still have this uh, negative legacy of uh, the Iraq war and that experience. Uh, and uh, um, uh, again, the security council was split. Some people argue, or the, the UN um, uh, you know, has absolutely no uh, ability to resolve such conflict. Uh, but uh, uh, when uh, the Security Council is split, that means the whole international community is split on, on very difficult uh, issues. And uh, um, uh, in fact, uh, um, there were a couple of uh, precedents where in recent history where uh, the US and others uh, went into war um, without obtaining um, uh, international support through the Security Council. One was very controversial, one was kind of acquiesced uh, afterwards. Um, the, um, uh, when, uh, again, uh, at the moment, uh, we, we'll find out what uh, the President, President Obama uh, would say tonight, but um, the, uh, the so-called Russian proposal that came out uh, yesterday uh, looks like it may have originated actually in what uh, Pre uh, Secretary Kerry may have said offhand, um, that uh, uh, if uh, uh, the chemical weapons in Syria could be secured and eventually destroyed, uh, that might lead to um, 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 a case where a military, military strike could be avoided. Um, and, uh, but he said, uh, I, don't, I, I don't believe the, the Assad regime would accept that. But it uh, looks like that sort of set fire. Um, and uh, the, the Russians came, came up with this proposal. Uh, the, the Syrian foreign minister uh, welcomed it. The Secretary General of the United Nations then suggested that uh, um, uh, the Security Council, in fact, uh, endorse such a proposal because Security Council resolutions are technically binding on all UN member states. Uh, therefore, um, uh, with uh, Russia, even China is endorsing such a proposal. The US, France, um, UK, um, if they are behind such a common resolution demanding Syria uh, that uh, their chemical weapons be placed under international control uh, and eventually destroyed, then that would um, um, uh, be a very, very strong signal of the international community uh, against uh, such um, uh, weapons of mass destruction. Um, also, um, you know, uh, I'm sure President Obama would make a case that uh, uh, those who used chemical weapons should be punished in some way. W would the military strike uh, uh, do that? Uh, my sense is that um, there's a, another way to go around it. Uh, the Security Council actually um, has um, 
uh, a prerogative uh, to re refer uh, any case, uh, any alleged case of um, um, uh, war crime, uh, crimes against humanity, and so forth, to the International uh, Criminal Court, ICC. And uh, in the past, uh, uh, there were instances uh, in which the Security Council, in fact, did refer uh, some cases to the um, International Criminal Court. The Criminal Court, even though the US is not a party to it, uh, came into uh, uh, existence um, on the basis of the Rome Treaty in 1998, I believe, and uh, became effective uh, in 2002, I believe. And any uh, crimes such as war crime, crime against humanity, genocide, can be prosecuted, can, uh, can be pr uh, prosecuted, prosecuted um, um, since uh, 2002. And there is no time limit to prosecuting such, such uh, people uh, who are engaged in those crimes. So uh, uh, if uh, uh, the Security Council um, decides to uh, refer the case, and including that uh, possibility into the uh, UN uh, Security Council resolution, uh, along with um, uh, the Russian proposal, uh, those uh, who uh, committed those heinous crimes um, could be uh, eventually prosecuted and brought back to the criminal court. Uh, in the case of Bosnia, the war in Bosnia and Herzegovina, those who uh, led the war and uh, um, um, uh, carried out the so-called ethnic cleansing um, were eventually brought to the international uh, um, court criminal court for the former Yugoslavia. Uh, it took time, but uh, uh, the civilian leader Karadzic and the military commander uh, Mrazic were eventually brought to the court. Uh, and so uh, um, that may be another way to go about this. Um, uh, so something to think about, um, uh, that uh, um, going, uh, um, resorting to military force without a scenario as to what next, what is the goal of the US in this uh, in dealing with the Syria? Without a scenario like that, uh, after a military strike, could uh, uh, provoke even uh, uh, very serious uh, negative consequences, unexpected consequences. Um, so uh, uh, it seems that uh, uh, at least we have one option that has emerged as uh, possibly viable option uh, in dealing with the current crisis. Anyway, I'll stop here uh, because I don't want to use the rest of <laughs> the, the panel discussion. And uh, again, I'll come, I'd like to come back to the four sub-themes later. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wakey. Um, so next, Dr. Chap, please. <coughs> well, thank you. Um, well, it's a pleasure to be part of this wonderful conference, uh, beginning last night with the dinner and then going through the events today. <coughs> I'm. Um, particularly happy to be here on stage with such a wonderful group of scholars and experts. Um, I'm just going to, since I'm the last speaker, I'm going to try to be brief. And I just want to make three, um, three sets of points about the US-Japan alliance. And I'll just give these to you up front. The first um, has to do with norms. Uh, the second uh, has to do with chemistry. Uh, and the third has to do with managers or management. Um, the first point in terms of norms, um, <clears throat> uh, there were times when, uh, so Professor Green and I were worked in the U.S. government at the White House for a period of time together, and there were times when we were uh, going to meet the Japanese where we had something that we wanted to talk about uh, that we would like Japan to do, and we thought, what's the rationale for it? And, you know, there are many different rationales, but one of the rationales was always, it's good for the alliance. Um, and when you think about that, when you use that term, it's good for the alliance, that's a very unusual way to think about alliances. Because the way we normally think about alliances are, is, I need something, you need something, we have some overlap, we ally. When we get that thing, we break apart. Right? That's normally the way we think about alliances. You enter into alliance because it's solely and purely in your interests. When it's not in your interest anymore, you leave the alliance. But that's clearly not the US-Japan alliance, right? The US-Japan alliance has evolved over time 
to become what I refer to as a, as a normatively based alliance, right? My first point about norms, a normatively based alliance. It has become an alliance that is a good in and of itself. Intrinsically, it's a good in and of itself. Now, how do alliances reach this level? I would say one of the reasons it would be if they deeply share common values, and very, very clearly the US-Japan alliance deeply shares um, common values. Um, the other is that when an alliance can survive you know, big policy differences and major changes in leadership, and very clearly the US-Japan alliance, as Mike has described, over its time has had some, has some very difficult issues, whether it was the economic issues, uh, whether it was beef, whether it was domestic political change um, in Japan, uh, whether it was um, um, the uh, earthquake, tsunami, and the meltdown in Fukushima. I mean, it's not only survived all these things, it's become stronger. Right? Um, and then the third element of a normative alliance is um, you know the alliance has this quality when it is perceived as having domestic legitimacy in both countries. And I think it's pretty fair to say that whether you are a foreign policy expert here in the United States or in Japan, or where you're the average person in the United States or in Japan, the two nations view each other and they view the alliance as something that is, it's, it's the right thing. It's the right thing to be in support of. It's the right thing to do. So there are not many alliances, I think, in, in the history of international relations that have achieved this quality. But I think the US-Japan alliance is certainly one of them. Second point is on chemistry. <clears throat> Um, in, in, in addition to all these other things, we, we can never forget that a very important element of alliances is chemistry and personal chemistry uh, between the leaders. In fact, when Professor Green and I teach internet, well, you teach a leaders course, so you probably do this more than I do, but <laughs> when you teach international relations, you don't often talk about leaders and chemistry, except for Professor Green's course, which is about leaders. Um, <laughs> Um, but it's incredibly important. It's an incredibly important part about alliances. And you know, the famous example here, of course, is the relationship that President Bush had with Prime Minister Koizumi. Um, I mean, these two guys loved each other. I mean, in a, in a you know, platonic sense of the words. They, <laughs> they really loved each other. And in spite of the fact that they didn't speak each other's language, I mean, Prime Minister Koizumi didn't speak much English, I don't think, except for Elvis Presley songs. And uh, President Bush, I don't think he spoke any Japanese. So. Um, but uh, that chemistry was very important because um, it filters, it, it, it affects the way the public views the relationship, and it also sort of permeates the bureaucracies of the two countries in, in, in um, seeing that this is an important relationship where um, if the two leaders make an agreement on something, these things need to be accomplished. I mean, when you have personal chemistry, photo ops look better, press conferences don't, uh, you know, are not awkward. Uh, you don't have dinners where both leaders are looking at their watch to see when the evening ends. It's just a very different dynamic. And, uh, and I think we've seen lots of relationships both in Asia and in the world where this personal chemistry really matters. I mean, to use your example, very much, you know, the whole question of chemistry between Obama and Putin, uh, and whether these two can really work together is another example. Um, we had to deal with the personal chemistry between President Bush and the South Korean President No Mu Hyun. There was no chemistry there, um, so it made the relationship much much harder. Uh, the last point I would make is about managers, and since this a lot this. Uh, at least this panel and this conference is about the future of U.S.-Japan relations. Um, and I hate to put my friend Mike Green on the spot, but I think one of the questions when we think about this in the future is, you know, who is the next Mike Green, right? With every relationship as deep as the U.S.-Japan relationship is, there are people that are seen as leaders in the relationship that help to manage the relationship, either within government or outside of government. And for you know, a, a generation, there have been those, at least on the American side, I mean, Joe Nye, Rich Armitage, Mike Green, and I think one of our tasks at Sophia and Georgetown is how do we help to train uh, the next generation 
of alliance managers that will help to continue to, to provide input when they're on the outside, to help um, uh, move the relationship forward when they're, when they're on the inside. Who are these people and how can we best train them? Um, uh, so those were the comments I wanted to make. Thank you again, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Dr. Chair. Um, as I uh, listened to your uh, point, and uh, I remember I used to have uh, so many Ichiban Shibori with you, Mike, um, back in <laughs> <laughs> early 1991, 92, and to discuss a lot of the things that related to the area Japan relationships, and then uh, you already had a dream, you know, to be a good manager for this uh, U.S. Fund Alliance and the U.R. So I'm very much proud of that as a friend of yours. And now we would like to touch upon the four topics which, is, uh, which are designed by Mr. Fujisaki. And number one is China, how to deal with the rise of China. Number two is North Korea, nuclear problem, as you know. Number three is TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership. And the last one is the, uh, as uh, he pointed out, the how to manage future course of U.S. Japan alliance and relationship. So um, as Mr. Wakey pointed out, uh, something's going on in Syria, and then I know that Mr. President is gonna make a major speech tonight at 9 p.m. Maybe he may uh, make his case uh, why United States should go ahead but strike against uh, Syrian government, Assad regime. And um, I don't think many Japanese would take that uh, seriously because to Japanese, yet Syria is far away. But I, I, as a foreign policy correspondent, I'm very much concerned if the United States would step forward, that means US would uh, engage more with Middle East and uh, spend more energy and money and the resources in Middle East, namely Syria. But you know, remember last year, Mr. Obama made a very big speech about strategic pivot or strategic rebalance toward Asia. This means US is gonna uh, spend more time and energy on how to deal with rise of China, I think. Uh, this is a very big moment and a big issue for Japan's sake as well, because for Japan, it's very much big issue how to deal with China. And uh, as you may know, of course, Japanese friends know, but American friends may know that we have some dispute with China these days over some small, tiny, tiny islands named Senkaku. But this is very much emotional. And uh, China, I, I've learned China just dispatched UAV yesterday to a territorial uh, uh, water or territorial airspace. And they are always intimidating us, you know, the, to demonstrate that those islands belong to China, not to Japan. This is a kind of big, big kind of issue for Japan to the United States to some extent from perspective of the uh, managing alliance, but it's not a big deal like Syria. So I wonder if uh, this uh, Mr. Obama's decision were how to what extent his decision would affect the uh, U.S. position toward China or even you know, your overall U.S.-Japan relationship. Now, having said that, I'd like to ask you, uh, each of you, that uh, if you I made and, uh, any comments, you know, how to deal, Mike said that uh, you know, it's, a, it's gonna be a very big problem, I mean, a task, I mean, how to welcome China in TPP, for example. So economic front, as well as the security front. So this is kind of a common agenda for United States and Japan. So is there any comment, anybody? You? Can you yeah. Me. Um, first of all, Victor, thank you for the kind words. And I'm sorry I told everyone about your interest in disco. <laughs> <laughs> I feel bad. Um, first of all, I don't think Japan allied with the United States to have an alliance uh, that's limited. I think Japan allied with the United States because it's a global power. Um, and over 90% of Japan's uh, oil imports come from the, the Middle East. Um, if Syria, um, we can get into a tactical debate about how to handle this, but if at the end of this process, Syria appears to have used chemical weapons with impunity, what's the lesson for North Korea, which has the largest chemical weapons arsenal in the world and is even less scrupulous about international norms than Syria. Um, if the US-Japan alliance looks um, divided over something as far away as Iraq, Afghanistan, or Syria, 
how will China interpret the strength of the alliance in East Asia? So I think it's um, uh, uh, unwise, you weren't doing this, but I think it's unwise to think about the US-Japan alliance as existing in, 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 in isolation in Asia. Japan's a global power. I mean, it, it, the US is a global power. Japan has global interests. Um, and we're allies um, uh, in, par in, in part, not just because of Northeast Asian security, but because the US maintenance or the US role in maintaining international peace and stability is so important to Japan. <clears throat> and Japan's support in and, 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 and the UN system, in overseas development assistance is important to that. So we have to be able to do both. <clears throat> um, uh, I think the, um, uh, uh, I, I think that the, um, uh, well, I'll save Syria for later if people want to talk about it. But on China, <clears throat> um, the, um, the President Obama did say something that I thought was very uh, well put. He said, we have a stake in China's success. And what he meant by that was, it's not good for the US, and I would suggest it's not for good for Japan, if China's economic growth slows down, if pollution gets worse, if civil society uh, can't grow, if there are protests. <clears throat> um, uh, we, we need China for growth. We need China to avoid bad directions with pollution and climate change. So we have a stake in China's success. Um, it seems to me that China cannot establish a kind of hegemony over Asia, um, doing what it's doing now. Um, the use of coercive tools by China will be met by the United States, which is still the most powerful country in Asia, and certainly globally. And even if the US power declines, India, Japan, Korea, Australia, there's a multipolarity there where China would in, in, invite other countries to balance against them. So China can't use coercion the way it, it, it seems to without significant backlash. China can't keep growing its economy when it's putting all of the investment into state-owned enterprises and starving entrepreneurs. China can't develop out of the middle income trap if it doesn't allow innovation and information sharing. And you can't do that without some liberalization in terms of the political system and freedom of speech. So I think President Obama was right. We have a stake in China's success because if China can do the right things for its economy and its people, it will be a much better China for all of us. <clears throat> but of course, we don't know where China's heading, so we need to um, hedge, engage, um, shape. There are a lot of words you use. In Washington, there's a debate um, about how much we should be engaging China to do this. And, and, and the classic example is Nixon's and Kissinger's diplomacy or Jimmy Carter normalizing relations in 79. So there are always people in this town looking for the big joint statement with China, the grand bargain. Um, the other view, which I would associate myself with, and your friends Armitage and I, the, the group that Funabashi Yoichi calls the Popeye Club, um, <laughs> argues, and this well, is my position, so <laughs> that, that's, uh, argues that to get China right, you have to have strong alliances and you have to get your, your maritime position strong and you have to have cooperation, not to contain China, but to set the rules of behavior in a way that China won't be tempted to overturn them. I think the Obama administration has kind of gone back and forth before, between those two views, but now is, I think, basically um, uh, recognizing how important Japan is to managing this, this China problem. Um, so we can't get China right without the U.S.-Japan alliance. Absolutely can't. I don't think Japan can either. Well, um, I have a uh, student from China. Mm -hmm. and, uh, she, is, she was the best graduate student that I ever had. And we talked freely about uh, our relationship. And one day, I talk about U.S.-Japan alliance. It's important. And she never understood that. China doesn't understand what alliance is. That country doesn't want to depend upon other country in terms of national security. And also India never understands the alliance. When I went to India a couple of years ago, and I talked to uh, Indian uh, researchers, and uh, he said to me that U.S.-Japan alliance is over, isn't it? And I, I was so scared. I, I didn't understand what he is talking about. We are close allies. It's never, you know, over. But to Indian researchers, if something came up between us, they always said, oh, alliance is over. <laughs> so having said that, uh, we are, of course, uh, whether we are Popeye Club or not, um, we are very close allies, that's for sure. 
And uh, uh, one more episode from my experience. Uh, in 2004, uh, Prime Minister Koizumi said that US-Japan alliance became uh, the alliance in global reach. We are global alliance. I didn't understand what the hell he's talking about. If the alliance goes global, well, our self-defense force act together with the US forces. We don't have that kind of capability. So what the hell is it? And now I finally understand what the global reach means. You know, we send our, you know, uh, Navy ship to, for the, the purpose of anti-piracy to, you know, Somalia. And uh, we uh, send our ground, uh, <laughs> our army uh, to Iraq uh, and many other peacekeeping uh, missions. So we do so many things in the global area. So uh, Japan is not like uh, the US in terms of global power, but we have global interest, that's for sure. Uh, so uh, if the United States and Japan can act together or can coordinate our policies in, with global issues, what China, what does China think about this? What kind of impression does China have? Okay, US-Japan alliance is so close. They are tightly knitted with each other. And I think that's uh, one very meaningful, uh, you know, um, area that we can develop uh, to persuade China uh, to cooperate with US and Japan in many kind of issues. Um, I think it's a fact that uh, China has emerged as a major economic power, uh, surpassing the, uh, Japan as a number uh, two uh, economic power in the world. And uh, Kissinger used to say uh, economic strength uh, leads to military strength. Uh, well, Japan um, didn't quite follow that dictate, um, even though when Japan uh, uh, emerged as uh, the second largest economy um, and still uh, strengthened its uh, defense capabilities, but not quite as uh, second largest economic power, I mean military power. Uh, now, an interesting question is, uh, would China translate its e economic uh, power into its military strength? And what's, uh, what we are witnessing over uh, Senkaku, the uh, Senkaku Islands, um, uh, it's kind of interesting, uh, who would benefit from such tension? Um, would the Chinese political leadership actually uh, um, um, uh, be delighted to have such, such tension with Japan? Maybe, maybe not. Would the Chinese military uh, benefit from such, such tension? Definitely. Uh, and as you know, the Chinese uh, um, uh, strengthening its uh, naval power uh, by having purchased um, uh, old uh, uh, aircraft carrier uh, from Russia and so forth. And uh, um, uh, the, the, the more the tension rises, uh, the more worries that uh, actually creates in the neighboring countries, particularly not just Japan, but also uh, the Philippines and, and many uh, Southeast Asia, Asian countries. Um, and in the case of the Philippines, um, uh, they started re-inviting re actually the U.S. Uh, to come to uh, um, the Philippines uh, and um, uh, even uh, possibly allowing uh, uh, their uh, air and military bases uh, by the U.S. again. Uh, so uh, um, uh, the Chinese leadership actually have to recognize uh, that uh, a tension that seemingly kind of bilateral with Japan has far uh, wider ramifications uh, in the region uh, and the um, uh, so uh, um, what uh, is important in this context is um, um, uh, at the political level, uh, we have to have a better dialogue, uh, uh, better understanding and, and, uh, and efforts to improve uh, political relations between Japan and China. Uh, of course, you know, that uh, um, 
uh, relationship still has a lot of uh, political uh, dimensions that um, uh, are not easy to uh, to resolve, uh, particularly those relating to you know uh, past uh, uh, experience um, uh, that is hard to uh, uh, deal with. Um, but still, uh, without uh, um, uh, much um, broader cooperation at the political level, um, uh, military tensions would increase, and um, uh, that would create a lot of uh, problems, uh, not only for Japan, the US, and uh, countries in, in Southeast Asia, but also China itself. Uh, so uh, I hope uh, um, the uh, uh, both, uh, particularly Chinese uh, uh, government, uh, would have this uh, clearly recognize, recognize uh, this kind of dimension. Uh, I'd like to just add one uh, uh, thing uh, from the UN perspective. Um, um, China, as you know, uh, is already uh, a permanent member uh, on the Security Council. Uh, just a historical coincidence, but uh, China. Um, is a permanent member um, uh, with a veto power, and um, uh, no Security Council resolution uh, can be passed without Chinese support. That also includes uh, uh, UN uh, amend amendments to the UN Charter. Uh, the UN Charter can be amended uh, only uh, with a two thirds majority um, of the countries uh, uh, supporting such you know any amendments, including five permanent members. So uh, uh, Japan, uh, to argue that Japan should become a permanent member, that argument is fine. But without Chinese support, this will not be realized. Um, and uh, um, China, uh, I mean, Japan used to uh, contribute to about 20% um, of the UN budget, a regular budget, uh, in about, I think, 2000, uh, year 2000. Uh, do you know how how, um, uh, how much actually? What is the percentage of Japanese contribution to the UN budget now? About 11. So uh, uh, in about a little over 10 years, the Japanese share of the UN budget has come down from 20 to about 11. Uh, in the meantime, uh, Chinese contribution, which was fairly negligible um, around the turn of the century, has gone up to five to six percent range. Uh, so uh, uh, you can see uh, that there is a gradual shift of power uh, in a way uh, that has some political uh, ramifications. Uh, but uh, uh, the matter of fact is, is that uh, matter of fact is uh, uh, that China is already a um, uh, major power uh, in world politics, and uh, uh, we have to deal with China in, 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 uh, with that um, uh, status already uh, there. China has been uh, aggressively um, um, undertaking uh, um, resource diplomacy. Uh, if you look at uh, Chinese um, influence in uh, Africa, for instance, um, um, China, uh, a large percentage of, for instance, oil exported by Sudan, South Sudan, was, goes to China. Uh, when I was in Zimbabwe, um, uh, there were Chinese companies uh, uh, exploiting uh, uh, natural resources. Um, and uh, for China, uh, how to uh, moment, uh, uh, retain the momentum, the economic uh, growth momentum, uh, is in fact a major uh, foreign, po foreign policy goal. Um, in the Middle East, um, Chinese government appointed um, uh, special, special envoy uh, to deal with the Middle East issues already some time ago. Uh, so uh, um, China's uh, global outreach actually is expanding and uh, uh, how to uh, deal with uh, expanding China, uh, not only in East Asia, but globally, uh, is actually a major challenge for both Japan and the US. Okay, um, Dr. Chair, uh, uh, since time is running out and we need to take some questions from the floor, I'd like to ask you uh, to touch up a little bit on North Korea. And after Dr. Chair, I'd like to ask you uh, both uh, Dr. Green and Dr. Hiratari about your, how to manage the future course of your ship and alliance. Especially, uh, I'd like to ask you to touch up on those kind of so-called history issues and then the perception gap between Washington and Tokyo. And uh, I, I believe that the, uh, what we are talking now in Tokyo is kind of we need to demonstrate the uh, collective self-defense, right? At the same time, we are trying to set up Japan's first ever NSC, National Security Council. 
Before I came here, I talked with some senior officials very much close to Mr. Abe. They are sure we're going to have that NSC very soon, by the end of this year or very early part of next year, which is good in my perspective because it's going to be a starter to uh, institutionalize this uh, alliance management with the United States, U.S. And NSC, namely. And, uh, but at the same time, there's uh, so many misperceptions among you Americans as well about Japan's position on those history issues. Um, comfort women, corner statement, or a screen shrine business. I do not buy those kind of ideas. But uh, yes, some ideological people in Japan, they be very much obsessed with those kind of ideas. We need to pay attention to shrine, or we need to scrap corner statement. I don't buy that, to be honest, as a realist. But I'd like to ask you, uh, Dr. Green and Dr. Hiratari, to mention those kind of perspectives as well. So first, Victor, Dr. Chair. Um, OK. Um, well, let, just before, uh, let me just say a couple of quick things about the whole Rise of China question. Um, the first is, um, you know, this is not going away, right? I mean, uh, this is the most important question uh, in global politics today, is China and China's rise. And as I tell my students, it's going to affect the way we study international relations for the next generation. Just like the Cold War um, was really informed all of our theories of international relations when we were in graduate school, China's rise and how that happens is going to affect the way we study international relations for the next generation. Um, uh, I think that um, the, you know, as, as Mike said, the Obama administration has this very, they have this phrase on U.S.-China relations that just sort of um, evokes sort of deep interdependence, right? They say at the last summit, they said there's no country that has a greater stake in China's uh, peaceful rise in the United States. Uh, and there's no country in the world that has a greater stake in the United States uh, recovery and, and anything than China, right? So sort of this deep interdependence. The problem, I think, is that, um, uh, at least in some Chinese actions, they don't really buy the interdependence argument. Um, in, you know, interdependence is supposed to create cooperation. I think some Chinese view interdependence as a chance to exploit vulnerability on the other side. So if uh, Japan trades a lot with China on um, uh, rare earths, then and China doesn't like something that's happening on the islands or in history, you use that right to try to squeeze the other side. So that's not the right use of interdependence. And that's, I think, one of the core problems that we have. The other thing I would say on the, when we talk about the alliance in China is, you know, I, I entirely agree that you know, there are two ways to work China. You work China from the inside out, which is you ally closely with China and try to shape what they're doing, or you work China from the outside in, which is you form all these relationships around China and try to help mold the path for them. Um, I think in the latter vein, when we talk about the U.S.-Japan alliance, we have to be careful not to talk about it as being a counterweight or a balance to China. Um, because I think everybody would agree that no one in the region wants to be forced to choose between China and the U.S.-Japan alliance. Um, everybody wants to have their cake and eat it too. So I think on the one hand, it's important to shape China from the outside. On the other hand, what we need to focus on is this three-way relationship, the U.S.-Japan-China. These are the three great powers in Asia. Historically, if that axis is stable, uh, the region is stable. Right? I mean, you have other problems, North Korea, other sorts of issues. But when that, that three-way axis is stable, then the region is stable. And so that's what we need to focus on. On North Korea, um, gosh, what can you say? Um, uh, I was out at the East-West Center in August um, doing a paper on the question of whether um, there is any change in North Korea under the new leadership. It was a really short paper. Uh, I wrote it in a day, and then I went to the beach for three weeks. And um, I'm always quite pessimistic on North Korea, but now we have Dennis Rodman. So um, we can count on him uh, to solve this. I mean, it's quite bizarre when one of this planet's weirdest individuals meets one of the weirdest leaders and says that that weird leader is trying to be normal. 
right? That just is not an equation that computes in my mind. Um, but in all seriousness, I mean, this is clearly a, um, it's, it's a growing threat. I mean, I think it is, uh, the problem has not gotten better. It's only gotten worse over time. Um, in December of 2012, they put a space launch vehicle, um, they put a payload into orbit successfully, which was a major advancement of their ballistic missile program. Uh, they've done three nuclear tests, and everybody's worried about a fourth one um, in which they could miniaturize a warhead and put it on a missile. Japan has been under threat from North Korea, not by this new generation of missiles, but they've been under existential threat from North Korea's shorter range missiles for, for years, decades now. Um, and in addition to that, we have this uh, problem with um, the uh, abduct abductions, the abductees. Um, these are, you know, these are clearly very difficult issues, and uh, it doesn't appear as though, despite this brief um, effort with Ijima, it doesn't really appear as though there's any chance of a breakthrough on these sorts of issues. The primary area where we're seeing some movement from North Korea, aside from Dennis Rodman, has been um, in inter-Korean relations, where uh, they've agreed to reopen this joint industrial complex. They've had some family reunions. Whenever this happens, it always raises questions from my Japanese friends and other friends who are like, well, do you think the Koreans are edging too closely to the North Koreans and they're sort of moving away from the rest of us? And, and I would say, especially with this current government, I wouldn't worry about that too much. I think um, President Park Geun-hye um, is the first South Korean leader that has already been to North Korea before she became president, has already met with the North Korean leadership, has already lived in the Blue House, the South Korean equivalent of the White House, before she became president. So I don't think she's as easily swayed by uh, sort of the political winds anytime there's a little bit of momentum. I think her center of gravity is pretty, pretty solid, so I wouldn't worry about that. Um, I do think, you know, one, you know, you always try to make lemonade out of lemons. And so I guess the one lemonade that comes out of North Korean behavior is if it can help to make Japan-Korea relations, South Korea relations, and U.S.-Japan-South Korea relations better, um, you can always count on North Korea to do something North Korean you know, a missile test, something. Um, and, uh, and we should all make lemonade out of that lemon uh, to try to improve the quality of dialogue and coordination among Washington, Seoul, and Tokyo. So. Thank you, Dr. Chair. Yeah, I uh, recently went to Seoul uh, to attend some bilateral uh, intellectual talk with Korean friends at the both side, and uh, uh, we are tired of you. Yeah. And actually, one former foreign minister from Japan said, um, I'm sorry to say, but I'm tired. So the Korean friends are saying Japan fatigue, and uh, while Japanese say we are suffering from Korea fatigue, this is a reality, but I agree with you, Dr. Cho. We need to uh, re-strengthen our tie with our OK, not just with, with the United States. But having said that, why don't you make a kind of quick statement or a comment on that, what I said to you about US-Japan and kind of history so, issues um, and that. Uh, from a, from from a U.S. perspective, mm -hmm. well, my perspective, yeah. um, Dr. Hibata, uh, uh, number one, the Obama administration has to survive. Um, I, I think of that, that scene in Last of the Mohicans when Daniel Day-Lewis is about to jump off the cliff and he turns to Madeleine Stowe and he says, whatever you do, you must stay alive. Uh, we've had a Japanese prime minister change every year. Uh, it's gotten to the point where I've started telling my students in courses on Japanese politics, you should memorize everything I say about Japanese politics because at the current demographic rate in Japan and the current turnover rate of Japanese prime minister, every one of you will be prime minister. <laughs> um, it's a little bit of an exaggeration. Having been in the White House, um, Victor can tell you, confirm this, I think Fujisaki Taishi will, maybe off the record, it's very hard to get things done when you're changing governments every year. So three, six years, that's the most important thing to make this alliance strong. Um, number two, uh, it's the economy, stupid. Um, Article two of the US-Japan Security Treaty is about the economy. From an American perspective, a strong Japanese economy has been we were afraid of it in the 80s, but basically it's been essential to peace and stability and the whole global system. So the third arrow of Abenomics has to really hit. Um, number three, um, 
updating the alliance. The two most important things are the creation of the National Security Council and recognizing the right of collective self-defense, which is in the UN Charter. It's a right Japan has. The only place that's weirder than North Korea is the Naikaku Hoseikoku, the Cabinet Legal Bureau in Japan. And they've determined for years that even though Japan has the right under the UN Charter for collective defense, Japan won't exercise that right. That's an anachronism now. I think given limited budgetary resources and growing challenges, Japan should have the right, has the right, should exercise the right to be able to plan with the US or other key allies to deal with crises that hit. The American side doesn't know exactly what Japan can do in a lot of scenarios, and we need more um, certainty. Um, nuclear power is very controversial, but without restoring nuclear power, Japan's economy can't grow. And then history, and you know, there's a perception in the U.S. and especially, uh, I, I, I briefed a very senior administration official, told him this number, and he was very surprised. Japan has 90, over 96% positive ratings in Southeast Asia. That means that people in Indonesia or Thailand like Japan more than they like their own country. Um, in South Asia, it's over 90%. I told you about the US and Europe. Um, so Japan is not isolated in Asia. Um, the problem Japan has is primarily on the history issue, Northeast Asia. In the case of China, it's, it's, a, it's uh, 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 Premier Zhou, said it would take three generations. It's, a, it's, it's in China's domestic political DNA, very hard. But Korea is the one where Japan, that should be the litmus test for, for Japan on how it's doing on history. There's no elegant, easy solution. Kevin Doak's written brilliant stuff about this. It's, it's complicated, it involves identity, domestic politics. But if, for Japan, the, the litmus test or the, the, the thermometer should be Korea. Um, because Japan needs Korea strategically, and to be really honest, for an American administration, Korea is a kind of check on how Japan is doing. If our allies, Korea, say Japan is a problem, it becomes a, then we think it's a, a problem to some extent. So, so Korea is really, really key, um, and uh, should be really the kind of um, lodestar and 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 way that Japan thinks about its role. I agree. Thank you. About the NSC, um, I think uh, Japanese government should put uh, some military uh, officers in, in the, the uh, mem member, as a member of NSC, uh, because without that, uh, it's, uh, they, they cannot decide very serious uh, national security matters. Uh, you know, that decision needs uh, professional military perspective and judgment. So that's my point. And uh, history, uh, thing, um, I think Japanese government should more uh, strongly about uh, the, uh, these 68 years since 1945. That's a long history, not before 1945. We pull us together, we democratize our political regime, and we, you know, uh, succeeded in, econo uh, in terms of economy. Uh, now it's a, it's a different story, but still these 68 years, we are uh, st strenuously taking effort as much as, as hard as we can to make Japan more democratic, peaceful, prosperous. So that's the point uh, the Japanese government, uh, especially Prime Minister Abe should talk much more about. And uh, U.S.-Japan uh, strengthening U.S.-Japan alliance. Uh, yeah, uh, 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 <laughs> my whole point is, you know, strengthen the Japanese Navy and secure our maritime domain with the United States. That's the point. Or rather, other navies is okay to join us, but that's the key. Thank you. So now um, time is running out, so floor is open for questions uh, from uh, those you know who like to make uh, some uh, a keen question to those four experts, uh, even to me. <laughs> so please go ahead, raise your hand, and uh, please take your microphone. Danny. Hi, uh, my name is Lonnie. Uh, uh, Ding Everson. I'm with the. Uh, I'm a first year graduate student at the MSFS program here at Georgetown. I would like to say first of all, thank you very much uh, for all of your comments and your time. Uh, very informative and uh, very interesting. 
Um, my question was uh, in particular reference to what Professor Green and Professor Hiwatari were talking about uh, in terms of uh, the Korea being a litmus test and also um, uh, the development of the Japanese Navy, for example. And um, I think previously uh, many people in Korea or in the Korean uh, government uh, would have seen um, Japan's building of the Japanese Navy or uh, the Japanese armed forces um, as perhaps a threat or that they would um, prefer like US dominance over Japanese military power um, rather than seeing Japan being a more equal partner to the Japan uh, US military alliance. And I was wondering if that might still be the case or whether um, you know, if that is still a barrier, how to overcome some ideas, how to overcome that barrier. Quick answers for both, from both of you, please. Um, well, Sam Moon, who's a student of Professor Cha's and mine, has done a really excellent and hopefully soon to be published paper on Japan-Korea naval relations and found, I think, um, that, I, I won't quote your paper, I'll tell you what I think, but I think you found some of this when you did your research too, that on a Navy to Navy and professional military level, there is a readiness in both Korea and Japan to do more because they recognize that um, the face that both countries, the threat both countries face from North Korea, they, they have to tackle together that, um, for example, when North Korea was testing its uh, last ballistic missile, um, Korea and Japan couldn't share information. Um, the US Navy managed to sort of slip information to both sides, but that's a very clunky way to handle a crisis. So I think for the professional military people in Seoul, there's a clear recognition that they need to do more with Japan, that the US-Korea alliance can't function without the maritime, naval, rear area support of the US-Japan alliance. And I think the professionals in Seoul know that. At the same time, politically, the Japan issues become more complicated because the Supreme Court in Korea has made some decisions, civil society is growing, um, and when you have a conservative government in power, they're vulnerable, particularly the daughter of Park Chung-hee, to charges of being too pro-Japan. So the politics in Korea have gotten more complicated. The politics in Japan have made it even more complicated. <laughs> but at the professional level, where people think about threats to their countries, there's a lot of appetite to move forward, um, and on the U.S. part as well. Can I just on this yeah, on this please. specific point? I, I I'd agree. I mean, it, yeah, if you talk to um, uh, Rock Navy or just Rock MND officials, the idea of military cooperation with Japan is not a problem for them, um, particularly when it comes to the North Korea issue. So at that level, I agree with Mike. The other thing is that at the public level, right, recent polling shows at the public level that a majority of Koreans have no problem with information sharing with, with military information sharing with Japan. So the problem is not the professionals or the public, it's the politicians, right? And the politicians cite sort of public sentiment and everything in Korea, but the public, the, the polling shows that there's no problem with it, right? So it's really the politicians that are the obstacle. So. Well, all our friends were politicians out there. So. <laughs> I, I cannot add anything um, other than those two professors said, but um, from my experience teaching at uh, uh, Maritime Defense Force Staff College, um, there's always a student from uh, Rock uh, Navy, of, from Rock Navy. And they're good. Uh, we can talk very uh, easily, and we can share the view, uh, what the threat is, and we can, well, act together on the, at the sea. But uh, my sense is that there's a lot of thing, a lot of work to do if both Japanese Navy and uh, Korean Navy can act together in the real term. So that's my sense. But uh, those professional level, they're good. Um, I agree with Dr. Chair that the, uh, it does matter about the politics. I mean, in August, as you may know, that Mr. Abe was almost here to pay a visit to Yaskuni Shrine. And every uh, realistic kind of advisor, inside government, outside government, like me, told him, don't do that. <laughs> That's the end of a South Korea-Japan alliance for relationship, and also, as well, U.S.-Japan alliance. And luckily, he did not, but you know, before August 15th, at the end of the, what we, we celebrate, the, the end of war, 
And then that is a special day for Mr. Abe to whether he should go to shrine or not. I, I was kind of folding my fingers, you know, if he would not go, he would go. I don't know. I cannot guarantee. So that, that's kind of where we are now. So we, uh, we need to persuade more. We mean Japanese persuade more politics or representatives. Uh, don't do any kind of uh, stupid actions or kind of, kind of speaking about our history or a shrine, because we know that it's going to stimulate kind of Koreans' kind of anti-Japanese uh, uh, sentiment. Uh, so having said that, is there any other question? You, you? Miss? Hello, I'm Kane Takada from Sofia University. And I want to ask a question in Japanese, sorry. 歴史問題について っていう風に感じるんですね。歴史問題っていうのがかなりその日本は加害者であったということをきちんと認識することが日韓関係、日中関係の発展につながる、その外交とかの態度、どういう認識をしているかっていうことが物事に取り組むときの態度に表れてくると思うので、私個人の意見としては日本の歴史認識っていうのは
perspectives, experiences, and archives um, become available. That's my my job to do. Your job. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Let's talk like about. Sounds like you're yeah, doing yeah. it. Yeah. Let's talk yeah. about uh, that matter in my yeah. class. So join join my class. <laughs> Good. I want to join your class. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, the, I, the 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 only thing I would add to all this is that it also it it's it's not just a matter of what Japan does. It's also a matter of what the region does too. Um, there has to be. There may need to be more of a debate in Japan about. Um, how one um, remembers history, but in the region too, there has to be a attitude, a mentality, a willingness to, or, or a willingness to be open or to be ready to move on. I mean, it's one thing for the Koreans to constantly say, "You need to apologize," "You need to apologize," and then when they apologize, you say, "I don't accept it." Right? <laughs> I mean, what's the use of apologizing then? So, there, the, per, the you know, so the other side has to be willing to move on and. You, I, you know, I think we're right now sort of in this vicious circle where uh, nobody wants to do anything. Uh, but I, you know, so I'm just trying to compliment the other side, which is yes, maybe there is something that needs to be done on one side, but there also has to be a willingness on the other side to move on. So. Japanese mentality is still quite interesting. When a very famous uh, US filmmaker, Oliver Stone, recently came to Japan, uh, Tokyo and uh, Hiroshima and Okinawa. And I interviewed him. And he said his theory is kind of the US did not need to drop a bomb against Hiroshima and Nagasaki because they are in fear of the uh, Soviet Union invasion to Asia. That's why President Truman decided to uh, use a bomb against Japan. That's his, his theory, okay? And Japanese media, TV stations, every day hmm. broadcast it. That, as he, she pointed out, that with those kind of you know TV programs, Japanese would naturally believe that okay, we are sacrificed, and that, in my judgment, that's wrong, and uh, that's kind of the sentiment of, of us in Japanese. And still, we have so we uh, Mike is right, and the media is very much important, and we have a huge uh, responsibility in doing uh, in changing our you know education, please. Um, you may remember the week before last, uh, uh, the Secretary General of the United Nations, uh, uh, Ban Ki-moon, who is Korean, of course, and my big, big, biggest boss at the UN, um, at the press conference uh, asked about uh, Japanese-Korean uh, uh, relations, uh, said something that set up the Japanese press. Um, basically, he said, you know, uh, to improve uh, uh, bilateral relations, um, the Japanese should reflect uh, on the past uh, to move forward. And that was taken as a criticism by the Japanese press. And then immediately, um, the, uh, even the Prime Minister Abe actually uh, took those um, uh, interpretation, uh, that kind of interpretation, and uh, uh, criticized the Secretary General of the UN. Uh, and the Secretary General has, had to kind of uh, explain, uh, clarif clarify what he meant. Uh, uh, by uh, referring to the kind of reflection. Um, but uh, um, I take it that he meant to be positive, that we have to move forward. Um, but uh, uh, the way the Japanese press interpreted it uh, uh, really um, was such that um, uh, it, they took it as a criticism of the Japanese, um, uh, particularly Japanese past, uh, Japanese attitude toward, toward the past. And... Um, uh, even before uh, the Japanese uh, uh, leadership uh, uh, reading the whole statement or seeking clarification, uh, started criticizing the Secretary General of the UN publicly. So uh, uh, we, and we had to sort of scramble uh, to respond to that. But uh, uh, the press, the media, of course, have an uh, enormous uh, power um, of influence uh, so that uh, once uh, certain remarks are taken, um, what we call out of a context, uh, then uh, uh, that could create an enormous political uh, problem um, um, for the Secretary General, uh, for the UN, and for the bilateral relations. Um, and uh, uh, we, you know, I work in a multilateral kind of environment, and um, there's no distinction really whether one is Korean or Japanese or whoever, or Russian, Chinese, we work together. Uh, towards a common goal. So uh, it's really uh, um, saddening to, uh, to see uh, those uh, uh, bilateral relations, particularly, um, you know, for Japan, Korea is an important ally. 
um, uh, along with the US um, and um, um, uh, whatever uh, historical issues uh, kind of remaining to be resolved. Um, if that poisons the atmosphere of uh, bilateral relations, that would not benefit either Korea or Japan. And uh, we really have to uh, make some, uh, um, some uh, progress uh, uh, on, on this score, uh, not just uh, sticking to legal issues, uh, things that are resolved in the, um, when the bilateral relations are restored, but there are some human dimension to many of those issues. And if just totally ignore those human dimension, uh, we may be, uh, in fact, uh, misleading um, uh, ourselves. Um, so um, I hope uh, um, both uh, uh, you know, Japanese and Koreans uh, uh, would uh, make additional efforts to uh, improve uh, our relations um, uh, so that the uh, um, bilateral relations do not become an issue. Um, we will have some territory dispute, but uh, um, again, uh, 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 you know, those issues should not really um, um, divert attention from the importance of maintaining bilateral relations. Thank you. Um, I wish uh, we could continue this kind of uh, rich and deep conversation with you all, but your time is running out. And thank you so much for your joining uh, this session. And uh, please uh, uh, say thank you to, for experts. Thank you. <laughs>